All right, everybody um, out there in in YouTube land, uh, thank you so much for for joining us tonight. I'm uh, I'm particularly excited about tonight. Uh, so my name is Matt Yancic, and I am the founder and I'm the head game master here at Manufactured Myth and Ledger Domain. And I want to welcome all of you to Roleplayer with a Thousand Faces. Uh, I really like to have creators on the show to talk about. Uh, all the cool stuff that they're doing and maybe the influences of their storytelling jobs or maybe their role-playing uh, uh, works um, or otherwise just narrative instincts. Um, so I am super thrilled to talk to, uh, you may have noticed this fellow next to me uh, who has such a, 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 a presence here that his, the length of his name has actually pushed my own name over to the side. Uh, I am talking to Walter John Williams tonight, uh, who is the author of dozens of works of fiction. Uh, I was sort of going through them before the show to, to make sure I was like remembering all of them, but there's so much stuff he has uh, that I couldn't, I couldn't really remember all of it. So uh, the cool thing, though, about Walter and his work is that he, in my opinion, and, and I think he might say this, but in my opinion, he, he, is, he shifts between genres very easily. Um, and his stories have had a major impact, not just with his fans, but with culture. He's regarded by many as one of the founding fathers of the cyberpunk genre. And uh, he's made it to the bestsellers list of the New York Times. He's been nominated for the Hugo, the Nebula, and the Philip K. Dick Awards, among many others, um, more times than I could count or track uh, and, and what, what was the, which, which did you win? Uh, I, I won a couple of nebulas. A couple of nebulas. Okay. There we go. Yeah. And, yeah. um, but at so... one point I was, the, I was the Susan Lucci of science fiction. I had been <laughs> nominated for more awards without actually winning any. My mother and... is going to be so happy that you're mentioning Susan Lucci. I, I like, it's funny. She was, Erica Kane was like her favorite right. character on, uh, yeah. I forget what it was, but, but I, I don't I, believe I've ever seen Susan Lucci doing her playing Erica Kane, but I know who she is. And, uh, and the thing is we both won awards eventually. So yes. you know, instead of being this singular figure who never <laughs> won anything, but was nominated all the time, I've now become just another award-winning writer. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Just another. Oh boy. Yeah. Well, if that weren't enough for you folks though, uh, Walter is the author of numerous, well, I was going to call the Hardwired series a series, but I know that you slightly disagreed and it ended up kind of being patched together maybe by editors or whatever uh, who were recommending that. He's mm -hmm. uh, also the author of uh, the Drake Magistral series, as well as the Metropolitan books, uh, Dread Empire's Fall. Uh, which uh, he has come to refer to and fans have referred to now as the Praxis series. And um, one of my personal favorites and one of the, the things that kind of got me into reading um, was uh, his bit parts in the mosaic novels, the wild card novels, um, oh, yes. which when I was very young, it was hard for me to read uh, or to take in like long works. And so what I liked is I, I skipped kind of some of the other stories, but I read through like Walter's stories. Uh, it was a little easier for me to digest. But uh, Walter, I'm talking way too much. Tonight is your night. Um, how are you doing? Uh, well, you know, I've, I've been in lockdown for about a year. So I am a little bit bored and I'm a little bit lonely. Uh, Which explains your that, presence here I, tonight. I, I, other than that, I'm thriving. I have to say, it's 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 been a lousy year for the world in general, but it's been okay for me. You know, nothing really too bad has happened. Oh, that's great. I'm I'm yeah. so glad to hear that. Um, so Walter, though, I want to start things off in a in a really positive way. I'm glad to hear that nothing too bad has happened to you, and I wanted to start with love. So I've I've heard in a few of your interviews that you you sort of you've mentioned that no one should ever write for anything other than love can you tell us a right. little bit about how you fell in love with, well, not, with not, not necessarily for for um okay we have to define love but I, I what i was talking about was the love of writing mm. not like the love of your readers which is nice when it happens mm -hmm. 
but that shouldn't be your motivation. You should, you know, if, um, you know, if you want to be loved by people, there are probably easier ways to do it. Uh, but, uh, point taken. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I love writing. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and when it's going well, it's just the greatest high you can imagine. And when it doesn't go well, it's the greatest frustration you can imagine. Mm. Um, so, but I've, okay, I, last month I celebrated my 40th year as a published author. I'd actually earn, started earning my living a couple of years before that, mm -hmm. but nothing had been published yet. Mm -hmm. um, and during that time, I have earned my living almost exclusively through writing or associated fields. Um, but it hasn't been easy all the time. I mean, I've had, I've experienced three or four career collapses. Okay, which led to my not being able to sell anything sometimes for years at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and during during which time money was running low and uh, frustration was running high. And, um, you know, I can't recommend this lifestyle to anybody who can help themselves. Mm. I mean, if you if 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 you are helpless in the throes of wanting to write, mm -hmm. uh, then you should do that because that is what will make you happy. Uh, but if you are, you know, if you can possibly help, you, don't do it for money, because most of us don't earn a lot of money. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm luckier than most. I'm not as lucky as a few others. Uh, but whether you earn money or not isn't up to you in this field it's it's up then most of it is up to chance mm. people become bestsellers through word of mouth they, they you know people may take out big banner ads and, and stuff but um mostly it's luck mm. as to whether you do well or poorly um there are so many things that you, if you if you are going with a traditional publisher there are probably six or seven places where it can all go totally wrong where somebody who's having a bad day which just, just forgets to do his job on that. You're day. saying steps along the way of getting that. Steps book, along the way to publication. Published. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, and, you know, the art director could commission the wrong art for the cover. All right. You can't control the art director. Uh, you, you know, or, it, you know, uh, I've had a couple of books that never got properly copy edited because the copy editor just didn't do the work. And so, you know, if anyone copy edited them, it was me. Hmm. Um, you know, I've had editors who had a nervous breakdown and didn't tell anyone and weren't doing their jobs. And everything was in place. Great advertising campaign, great promotion. Yeah. Beautiful cover, wonderful production. Yeah. But my editor never sent it to the printer. Wow, that's a that's a major. What's that's a major thing. I what's funny yeah, yeah. though is hearing you say these things. Like uh, when I go to a so I was just talking to Walter for a few minutes before this, and I was talking about how I entered into uh, I went into a bookstore the other day, and what's funny mm -hmm. is you go into a bookstore and I see all the you know really nice covers and I see the books laying out and all of that and I see the end product, but uh, you know beyond things that I've maybe read or stories that I've heard, I don't really know exactly what's going on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, yeah. what you're describing sounds a lot like, it just sounds like normal life. Like I think sometimes when I think of say, uh, being a writer, there's like this idea of like, oh, it's super glamorous and like, it's fantastic and all of that. There can't be any workman like, or craftsman like qualities to it. But it sounds like what you're saying is it's, pretty much the same as as any a lot of other things uh, uh well it's it, it depends on human factors but mm -hmm. publishing is kind of unique because it has a 19th century business structure mm -hmm. right i mean the last time publishing changed its method of operation was like in the 1940s mm. when suddenly paperbacks became a thing right and so they had to adjust to allow for paperback paperbacks and paperback originals and, and so on. Yeah. Cause before that paperbacks were the, the equivalent of comic books that are penny dreadfuls. They weren't, mm -hmm. 
you know, you, you didn't get a real book. Right. 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 But um, World War II, there are a lot of soldiers overseas. They couldn't be carrying big stacks of hardbacks around. And so the army printed a lot of books for their soldiers to read. And so um, paperbacks became normalized mm. and there became a demand for them. Mm. Uh, and, and then, you know, ebooks happened, you know, in the last 15 years. And that ha hasn't changed publishing as much as you'd think. Well, I was going to ask, how, are, are there many differences or like, is it essentially kind of the same thing now? Or have you noticed like there's some benefits to it or some drawbacks or how would, how do you feel about it? Uh, well, I, I think you can reach a wider audience. Mm -hmm. The more platforms you can occupy, the more people those pat platforms can find, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, uh, my paperbacks are fifteen dollars, right? Yeah. My ebooks are less than that. If you buy the ebooks that I have personally published, that's um, you know they're four ninety nine, and I make more from one four ninety nine ebook that I publish myself than I did from a thirty dollar hardback, for example. Wow, that is a Wow, that's an eye opener. Yeah, I hadn't been so, expecting that. So, for, for uh, fortunately, I was kind of an early adopter. It was one of those things happened where my career collapsed, mm -hmm. and so I had all of my backlist, and I just decided to put them out as eBooks. Mm -hmm. And I taught myself how to do that. I did just about all the work myself. Um, and I'm I'm married to a copy editor, so she did the copy editing. There you go. That's that's your best defense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So tell you know, me, I gave, she got paid in nights out on the town, you know, there you that's, go. That's, yes, yeah. that's right. Tell me you've, you know, it's hard for me to imagine this. You've mentioned this a few times and you're, you're honest when you say this, you've mentioned that your career has collapsed several times. And yet again, my, as the reader going into a bookstore, I see the, the latest Walter John Williams book and mm -hmm. I, I find yeah. it on the shelves. And to me, the transition between books is seamless um you've mentioned before that you have kind of like had to shift careers sometimes between these pauses is yeah how how is it that you go about doing that well uh, it was the uh the first time uh, my career collapsed was like 1982 mm -hmm. so and i was i was writing historical fiction i was right. reading re writing historical sea adventure fiction like um you know Patrick O'Brien or yeah the CS4. Horatio Hornblower type, yeah. and my my mine were different because my protagonists were Americans, not British. Mm -hmm. And I have an English friend, and her her son was reading my books, and he came to her and he said, "Walter's writing about the wrong side, the wrong people." That's <laughs> yes. right. The Americans don't use yeah. boats. What's going on? Yeah. I was writing. I was writing from the point of view of the villains, according to him. So ah uh, right, uh, yeah, that's true, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah I was, but they're bad guys. Uh, so, um, but anyway, uh, the market for historical fiction collapsed. Had nothing to do with me. I didn't do it personally. Mm -hmm. Had nothing to right. do with what my books were and what my books were doing. But just the entire American North American market for historical fiction collapsed in the early '80s, and it never came back. And so I had to find a new career. So I was sending out proposals for. Um, I think probably every category except genre romance. I, I was I was sending out proposals for literary novels, for mm -hmm. mysteries. Um, I was working on a, a horror project. Uh, I sent out science fiction, and the science fiction sold. So I became a science fiction writer. So you just um, made this is a conscious choice based on the fact that that was the one that sold, and you said, okay, now I'm going to write. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so I was going to continue writing science fiction as long as people kept buying the books, and they did. Hmm. And the classic, uh, the the yeah, genre and, change. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, well, see, a lot of my other proposals, my non science fiction stuff, got rejected because it was too weird. What was rejected then? I really want to know because I, uh, because the interesting thing here's the thing when I've I've watched and listened to interviews with you and from what you've described of maybe your your foundation of knowledge of say science fiction or whatever 
you were saying it was coming out of like novels from the 60s and 70s mm. and to me those were kind of weird novels because a mm. lot of people will say those are maybe the that's like the the like the 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 embryonic beginning of like cyberpunk in some instances and um yeah i think so was it kind of like in that vein and then maybe those novels were dying out what were the ones that were rejected in the early well uh let's see i wrote a mystery um uh about a, a the protagonist was um a out of work guy um he was out of work he wanted to be a writer um he was taking a lot of drugs the um the whole mystery plot, plot revolved around illegal pharmaceuticals which were being consumed by my protagonist and his friends and resulted in a death and it turned out that anyway so um i think the the rule was you can't have drug users be protagonists in yeah. a great on genre mystery novel um Oddly enough, I put those guys in hardwired and they fit. And they fit right in. They fit right in, yeah. But see, this is an interesting thing. And I feel like this would be, this is something that's sort of unique, I would say, to you. So um, my impression is that whenever I go into bookstores uh, and I've read interviews with many writers who will say things like, well, you've got to stay in your lane. If you write science fiction, you have to write all science fiction. If you write, mm -hmm. um, you know, literary fiction, uh, you have to write literary fiction and horror, horror. And what's interesting to me, though, and, and what actually makes me admire what you do is that you're, you're sort of mixing things up. You're taking something from, say, you know, the, the harder kind of maybe, I don't want to say, maybe the, the William S. Burroughs sort of mm -hmm. feel and mixing it in with a more literary, uh, like with, with mainstream maybe mystery, and you're sort uh -huh. of crafting something new. Um, yeah. How do you feel in retrospect about like that novel? Do you look back on it and? Well, I, okay. Um, the perfectly commercial thing to do mm -hmm. after I had a success with Hardwired mm -hmm. was to write Hardwired 2 and then Hardwired 3 and then Hardwired 4 and then Hardwired 5. <laughs> and, um, and I decided deliberately not to go that way mm. to keep on building my career in other ways and because by, i knew that by the time i wrote hardwired six i wouldn't have an audience left right they'd have all got tired of it and yeah. i would have become stereotyped as somebody who wrote this one particular kind of thing over and over yeah. um yeah. and the other thing is is science fiction is like the biggest candy literary candy store in the world because you literally can go and you know grab some gumballs and some chocolates and, and mash them together uh, and the and the audience tends to be fairly forgiving of that kind of thing. Um, I like I like to keep both myself and my audience surprised, and 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 just do a change up. And and you see, unless unless you experiment, you don't mm -hmm. get to be a better writer. And one of my one of the ways I, one of my uh, uh, goals is to be a better writer all mm -hmm. the time. Um, and unfortunately, some experiments fail, and we'll never see the light of day. Um, but um, you know, and 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 so, you know, I, I have kept selling aside from you know a few sad intervals when I wasn't. Um, and the last one I turned to good account, uh, simply because I digitized all of my backlist, mm -hmm. and suddenly there were I had you know like thirty two, thirty three books out in electronic yeah. format right yeah, you... and, and it was it, i had to say i was getting the nicest paychecks i'd ever had in my 30 plus years of being a writer um and uh and that's that's not happening anymore because my my ebooks are not competing against two million other ebooks most of which suck and and you can't tell whether it's going to suck or you know if you if you look at an ebook you don't know whether it's going to suck or not yeah. You know, it's it's not you can't you can't really flip through it and see if it's uh, written as well as you like or if it has a as as cool an idea as you'd want uh, or if your characters are well developed. You can't you can't do that kind of browsing that you can in an actual bookstore. Right. And that's something it's funny. That is something that gets me when I'm browsing like selections on my Kindle. Uh, mm -hmm. You can download 
you can download like a first chapter or whatever. Yeah. But there's, I get very suspicious because everybody knows, or at least from my own reading perspective, you can go in there and you read that first chapter and you know that the, the author is just firing on all cylinders, trying to make every little thing happen. But then the moment you turn to like chapter two, you're like, okay, now how's it going to be? Or when you flip to the middle or whatever. And mm -hmm. it's hard for me sometimes without that tactile, even the smell of it mm -hmm. is, is tough. I mean, I read books on my Kindle a lot, but um, my preference is usually to read hard copies whenever I can. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and I trust, I don't know what it is, but I trust those hard copies um, because like you're saying, you don't know always what you're gonna get. Like I've been reading mm -hmm. and I'm into chapter three and I'm like, why why are there so many proofreading errors or what's wrong with the formatting? Okay. Even things like that. How yeah. Uh, you know, I, um, I have a mixed economy when it comes to uh, the books that I personally own because I really do prefer physical books mm. but um but i i literally ran out of places to put them yeah you know and and also when i i tra when i'm not when there's not a pandemic happening i travel a lot and every time i traveled for years and years i'd have to carry 50 pounds of books with me now i can carry my kindle <laughs> yeah that's the same here it's so funny i have lived in three different i've lived in los angeles anchorage and now boston and the funny uh -huh. thing is I have about six or seven uh, uh, cardboard boxes of books that mm -hmm. follow me everywhere I go. And gradually I've been whittling them down and I hate to sort of mm -hmm. do that. But the Kindle is so much, I mean, it's, I can't remember where I'm, where I said it, but it's right around there somewhere, but it's always at hand and it's always around and it's always something I can open up provided I, I feel like the story is there and the, yeah, you know, you know I'm, I'm happy. I was with... I was doing a major house cleaning, and uh, and so all of the books that were in my library are now in boxes, and I was going through them and I was donating to the local library uh, any book that had no sentimental value mm -hmm. and that I could get an electronic version of if I needed to if I needed it for some reason. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but then the pandemic happened. And the place that I was donating my books to is no longer open. Yeah, isn't that a shame? Yeah. I, I miss that. I was just, I was, I remember before I was getting to, because I had just moved here to Boston and I was just getting to know my local library. And I, uh -huh. I had picked out like a nice little spot where I would do my work or where I would get a book and sort of experiment and just read through it for a few hours and mm -hmm. see. And then around the time that I, you know, around the time that, that I was just getting comfortable, the library's all closed and I, I miss going yeah. to, I miss those those little nooks and little corners uh -huh. yeah. in the library. Mm -hmm. Are you- Yeah, and, and you have to think, do I want to risk my life in order to check out a book? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's I know, it's a, it's a weird, surreal kind of age that we're, I feel like yeah. we're living in right now. Um, well, can you tell me, what is it then? So you're, how do you do these shifts between genres then? So if you're kind of, in a way, moving between science fiction sometimes and then what, um, you know, what may be considered fantasy here or you're mixing and matching, do mm. you do any sort of, does it just sort of come instinctually to you or are you reading a lot of other works or doing some research to sort of say, hmm? Yeah, well, you know, I, I obviously do do a lot of reading, so there's that. And, and probably, you know, a great source of inspiration for me is other writers, mm -hmm. you know, where they, they, they can simply just throw off an idea that they're not using, right? But they, they kind of throw it out and go, oh, wait, that'd be interesting, if, especially if I combine it with this other idea from over here and this third idea from, from uh, you know, the news magazine that I was reading this morning. Uh, and and then you get a plot, right? But I, I have more ideas for books than I will write in my lifetime. Uh, so my particular choice depends on what I want to write at any particular moment and what I can sell to a publisher. Hmm. So there are, there's, um, I had my, my Metropolitan series is incomplete and it, it was, it attracted a good deal of praise and attention at the time. Yeah. yeah. 
uh, when those two books came out, I never got a chance to write the third because my editor was fired and his science fiction line was canceled. Right. And because the science fiction line was canceled, those books were viewed as failures, even though they were nominated for awards and were well regarded and stuff. And no other publisher wants to publish another publisher's failures. Right. Do you ever so, think you will somehow get a chance to go back? Because I, again, this is something else I've heard you mention in a few interviews. Yeah. I mean, imagine, I, I, I don't have to tell you to imagine because it's what happened to you. But after two books, is there some way to get that third book out there or somehow? At oh, least yeah, I, could, uh, I, I can always self-publish it if no one else will want it. But um, I, am, I am sort of now to the point where I'm financially secure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, money is not necessarily the most important calculation in what I choose to write at any given time. Mm -hmm. So I think that book will get written fairly soon. That's good. That's actually good news. Is this the first yeah. we're hearing of this? Is this uh, I think I think it's the first I've announced it to anybody except my close friends. Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh my goodness, it's an exclusive. Yeah. You you heard it here first, folks. Yeah. Um, thank you for that exclusive, Walter. Um, but let me ask you then. So when you're going to sit down to do your writing, um, do you have some sort of a an approach or a method, or is there uh some sort of a schedule you keep yourself on? Um, it's it's dogged persistence. I write every day, every day that I'm home. I mean, if there's if I have some social obligation or if I'm traveling, then I allow myself not to not to write. But um, and which is which is you know why you know people now that we're in a pandemic, people are forgetting what day of the week it is and stuff. I've been doing that for thirty years, <laughs> right? Because yes. one of my days is pretty much like the next. Yeah. You know what, what did you do on Tuesday, Walter? I wrote. Yes. You know, what did you do on Sunday, Walter? Oh, I wrote. I wrote. Uh, so, yeah. So that's, uh, you know, I'm I'm not that prolific. I'm not that fast a writer, but I, I'm just dogged and I just do it every day. Well, I was going to say, yeah. though, haven't you put out a book, basically, essentially a book a year for close to that? Yeah. Most of your your career. Yeah. So then can I can I kind of assume that it's literally about a year that it takes you to to move well, from one? Usually, usually a a novel is like seven to nine months, mm -hmm. and then it gives me some chance a chance to write short fiction, you know, right. for the rest of the year. Um, the last few years have been very different because I had two contract, two separate contracts, two separate three book contracts with two different publishers. So I had three Quillifer books to write and three Praxis books to write, and the editors were um, were good with me alternating. Mm -hmm. Um, and that meant I didn't get stale. You know, if I had to write three Praxis books in a row, they, I would be getting stale by the end of that. Right. So you and are I, kind of leapfrogging between. Up. Yeah, exactly. And uh, if I do the third Metropolitan book, that'll be yet another change up. Right. Right. And is, do you have any problems going between, you know, Praxis to Quillifer? I mean, they're, to me, they seem so... Because I, like to me, Quillifer has this, um, it, it kind of has, I don't want to say it's lighthearted because it's definitely not, but, mm -hmm. and, I, and I also don't want to say it's swashbuckling because it's, it's not just, it's not that. There's something about Quillifer that's quite different than what you might read in a Praxis novel. Mm -hmm. Do you have trouble maybe shifting gears between those two? I guess you're saying you feel fresh when you do this. Yeah, yeah. Um... I you know I I have a little problem with the translation right at the transition right at the start, but generally, I will finish a book on Friday, and then I'll do a little celebration. And when I get up the next day, I'm probably a little slower than usual, but I will start the next book book right away unless there's something else occupying my time. And so you just uh, I just go from one right to the next, because because once again, love I love it. Yeah, I love doing this. Um, I would do it for free. Don't tell anyone. Okay, I'll I'll edit. I'll try to edit that part out. But honestly, yeah. Walter, it's live. Everyone's just yeah. heard it, and it's the yeah, internet. Yeah, okay. It's out there yeah. now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so then you wake up. It's the morning. It's uh, oh. you finish one book on Friday. You you stretch. You step out of bed, oh. and 
you sit down at a typewriter or do you go for a walk to get your kind of your mind I, working? I, I, I write late at night. Oh, okay. So I spend my entire day getting ready to write. And then about like 10 p.m. I start to work and I work till around one or two in the morning. Oh, okay. And so you're it's one not of... because the phone never rings. Mm -hmm. You know, no one ever bothers me. I'm just, just there with me and my laptop and whatever music I feel like playing. And, uh, and I go. Ah. But, but, you know, the, the thing about the Quillifer is one of the things that makes it different is that it, it, Quillifer is a love, love letter to the English language. Yes. Yeah. Well, Quillifer himself right. is inventing words mm -hmm. yeah. all of the time. And, and I, I love the fact that he's, he's doing that. I love the fact, actually, what I like about Quillifer is um, in some ways, I mean, he's almost like a representation of of maybe the fact that you seem to have like a, a, a finger in multiple pies at the same time. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, his his father was a butcher, so he comes from that sort of background. But then he's apprenticing as as a lawyer. Oh, right. And then he's also basically just sort of traveling across um, the land. And like, so he's yeah. got like he's got kind of multiple aspects to him. And I, he's, I mean, he kind of like reminds me of the sort of hero that I would, maybe that's why I enjoyed the books, but um, the sort of hero I'd look up to, he's got a, a little bit of, he, he's a bit of a Renaissance man. And I guess that's yeah. by design because of the. Yeah. Well, it's, it's set in, it's set in a Renaissance like world. Right. Um, but yeah, but he's, he's a young guy on the make, you know, and I think everyone can identify with that. Yeah. You know, the young guy is trying to find his place in the world. And he's, you know, he's not interested in doing any magical, mystical quests or anything. He just wants to to do well and be appreciated for who he is and um, and chase ladies. Yes. That was yeah. another theme in the books as it well. Is. It was the yeah. first, I think it was, the, wasn't it like the first scene? I'm trying to remember now. It was the first scene in the first book, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, the first scene he's when scrambling he's out of this woman's uh, yeah. yeah, this woman's bedroom with the with the guy's father chasing it or right. the girl's father chasing it. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. And so when you're working, if it's not the entire year, it's seven or eight months. Mm -hmm. Um, and so do you write out a first draft, or do you outline first, or do you just sort I of outline ruthlessly? Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I, I really work out um, the first the first three Praxis books. Before I wrote the first sentence, I knew what the last sentence was going to be. And That's... that meant that I could pitch the story through all three volumes right to that one last sentence and make that last sentence mean something. But um, the Quillifer series is, uh, I sold three books because that's all they'll buy. You know, but but it's it's I've plotted for six. I was gonna say, and they they carry Quillifer from eighteen to old age, mm -hmm. and, and you can sort of chart his his development, um, you know, as a as an adventurer and as a human being, uh, throughout all of that. How much of that will change? Because I I know um, you mentioned just now that you've kind of plotted these ideas out. But how much of that kind of changes, like maybe say when you're in the middle of writing the most recent book, like or your next book, your next Quillifer, um, how much like do you get halfway through the book and you're like, wait a minute, I know. And then like you have to throw out a future book and like, yeah, well, I don't throw out a future book, but I, 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 I have been known to discard written chapters when I realize that they were pointing me in the wrong direction. Yeah. Outlines, outlines can't fix all your problems. Mm hmm. But they can anticipate a lot of them. So um, I have problems with the middle parts of books because I know what the beginnings are. I know what the endings are. How I get from one to the other is more problematical. Yeah. And classically, I, that is the tough, that's the tough like part of, yeah. of most I feel like stories, I could right? brandish my visual aid at this point. Yeah, of course. I'm so, you know what I was, yeah. you, you should. <laughs> I should have prepared, actually, um, I should have uh -huh. prepared like some nice like imagery to, to yeah. superimpose, but I have actually been running a snowblower all day. So I but if, been if you to... notice, Quillifer has a particular smirk on the cover of this book. He and does. that smirk 
the, the my editor and the and the artist went around for I don't know how long on the smirk. We went through many many smirks before we got the right. Just one. trying to settle on the proper one yeah. to encapsulate that quillifer. Yeah, deal. yeah. Um, so in in that case, then, uh, if you're moving between genres and you're outlining, and um, is there to that end? Is there some genre that you have not tackled yet that you're kind of looking for forward to tackling in the future? Or do you feel like you have enough now to play and, and you can kind of do what, what you want and you're happy where you are? Uh, well, I'm, I'm pretty happy where I am because I, I have a lot of freedom right now. Um, so I don't have to write anything I don't want to write. Um, and I have lots of ideas, um, and, uh, and, and I'm enjoying myself, you know, the pandemic aside. Uh, so, um, <laughs> so we have, uh, it's, it's a, you know, I'm, I'm in a good place right now, you know, professionally speaking, um, as to whether I will pit, throw myself into a whole new genre. It's more than possible that that'll happen, but I don't know what it is yet. Right. Because I noticed on um, when I was sort of, again, I was researching a little bit. You hmm. are a bit of a Renaissance man, kind of yourself. And I mean, I can't help but think that that is partly what must be inspiring this this keeping yourself fresh idea of like moving between a few different genres mm -hmm. and all of that. How much of your own... Uh, life kind of informs the works that that you create like how much of oh, well, Quillifer it can't, it can't is actually do it. you well Quillifer does kind of resemble me at the age of 20 it doesn't surprise me yeah not at all um you know I'm not that person anymore but um I got kicked out of graduate school for being Quillifer basically uh so uh, what were you in? Let me ask you, what were you in graduate school for? What were you studying? English. Oh, of course. Yeah. Ah, turns out it, that's... It was my way of postponing adulthood for a little while. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you seem to have done English pretty darn well for yourself yeah, yeah. without without your grad degree. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, but, you know, I, I don't have the degree, so I'm not qualified to teach. Well, I in don't... A, in a, in a, in a modern university because I do not have the terminal degree, but I teach anyway. Yeah. I started college. <laughs> there, there is, oh, you're teaching in a college now or, and this is no, not... no, I, I just, I just started my, well, all right. There was a period uh, when a lot of my friends uh, were having suffering career collapse. And so they were all going to get um, uh Degrees. They all, a lot of them went back to college to get degrees that would enable them to teach writing. And I thought, okay, I could spend eighty thousand dollars to get this degree, mm. or, and then I'd have only a ten percent chance of finding employment. If I did find employment, it would probably be at like some liberal arts college in some godforsaken corner of the Midwest where I wouldn't want to live anyway. Right. So I said, I'm going to start my own workshop. And I did. So I started Taos Toolbox. It's That's gone what I for was... 15 years now. Yeah. Uh, and it's and it has been a terrific success. I have to say, we've produced uh, Hugo and Nebula award-winning authors, um, probably a, at least a dozen. Nice. I don't, they don't always I tell knew me there were, you know. I but, knew there were a few. I didn't know. Wow, a dozen. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, so... and um, and we we have a really good program. It's two weeks every year in the mountain of new mexico um and it's it's just done really well and i i couldn't be more pleased um i i i was a little worried about being being a teacher but it turns out i have a lot to say well mm -hmm. uh yeah right i but see i think d let me ask you this as a teacher do you f i i have so for those of you that are watching at home i'm a, i'm a teacher i'm an english teacher mm -hmm. um do you feel that your teaching has affected your writing at all? Have you kind of, have you ever felt like you're teaching something in class, 
you're talking mm-hmm. about something and you just feel like you've taught yourself something in a way, something yeah. new or. It, it, it's um, I wrote this in my blog just uh, last week, I think, but I had, I had kind of come to a standstill in, in the book I was working on. And I said, well, I teach this stuff where, what would I tell my students? if they came to me with a similar problem. And so I I went and I looked at my own lecture notes that I teach from every year. And I said, this is what I tell them and this and this. And I had my little breakthrough (laughs) and now the prose is flowing again. Um, No, but I completely, I completely understand what you're saying. And, And I don't know how you feel about that. But for me, there's actually this kind of warm feeling that I get. And I'm like, because there are sometimes maybe for me uh teaching after 20 years it can sometimes get to be a little bit of a grind but then every once in a while you get that student that comes to you or um you say something in the classroom and it's almost by accident or it's almost something you sort of remind yourself that these aren't just words like these are also things that affect the way that other Mm -hmm. people behave and and practices that they and and that's always like a really good kind of kind of moment i think Uh Um, yeah. at least for me as a teacher. I do, you know, some, and, and, and when you can actually help somebody break through, it's just terrific. If I can, there was one recent example where I said, this story feels psychologically true. And it is powerful, powerfully psychologically true, but I don't believe any of the action because it doesn't make sense. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you need to look at the, your, your idea for this is fine. And yeah, the prose is good and it really has impact, but you need to look at the action, that actual action that's going on and restructure it. This brings me to a, a question that's tangentially related. How many is it? Can we say you do a certain number of drafts? Do you? Not anymore. Through, not anymore. So Because it's all on a word processor. So I, I start the day by revising the previous day's work. And then every so often I go back and I look, you know, and then I look at the preceding chapter and revise that a little bit. So, so, you know, there's, there's first draft and then there are multiple, probably everything gets gone over five or six times by the time I'm done. Because you keep kind of rewinding to refresh yourself yeah. and then you start mm-hmm. from that fresher yeah. or from that last bit. Or I come up in something, okay, this, this is, this is a good piece, but it needs to be earlier. So then I have to rewrite the earlier chapter where I'm inserting it. Um, do you do you find how many pairs of eyes will look at it so like after you've completed it uh-huh. you hand it over to someone how many will another like set of eyes look at it and kind of say well walter do you want to reconsider this chapter and move this around and what about uh-huh. if that happened currently or... currently it's my wife who looks at everything mm. usually as as i'm working on it um and uh i I greatly support the idea of workshops and I was a member of a local workshop for over 30 years. But what happened was Tao's toolbox, Mm. the Tao's toolbox, that workshop takes so much energy that I just couldn't face workshopping uh, for the rest of the the other 50 weeks of the year. Yeah, I can, I can understand that. Like sometimes I wonder like, Oh boy, I'm, what am I subjecting my students to? I don't know if I could, turn around and, and have the same thing brought down on me. Um, so I, I do understand that. Um, I want to kind of shift gears here a little bit um, and and go a little bit off on a tangent. But uh, we were talking earlier about your uh, upcoming your upcoming uh, gig uh, running oh, yeah. a game as a game master. I, yes, I will be game mastering at WonderCon. Uh, again, a virtual convention, so it'll be it'll be live streamed on the twenty seventh Saturday, the twenty seventh of March, I believe, and it'll be a wild cards scenario. Bonus, yeah. Walter John uh, Williams is GMing. So does that mean that the players is this going to be canon for wild cards, or is this just? Uh, it, it, I I doubt it'll be canon, but all <laughs> the players are wild cards writers. Oh no way! The, oh my yeah, gosh, Max, even better. Max Gladstone, no. uh, Melinda Snodgrass, Carrie Vaughn. 
uh, just it'll be an awesome cast. That is so funny. The the so the reason why I brought that up is because we've been kind of talking so much about going back, revising, rewriting. Um, I'm kind of curious to know, and and for again those of you at home, the I can't remember. I, I do remember the first time I saw like a copy of Angel Station sitting on on the shelf at B. Dalton, yeah. which is uh, one of Walter's earlier books. I can't remember if I saw that book first or if it was the Wild Cards books uh mm -hmm. first that i saw either way one or the other but i have a funny feeling it may have been those and the wild card series got me into reading and it was one it was definitely one of the influences because when i first started i, I wasn't much of a reader as a, as a kid and uh, i would pick up small digestible bits and mm -hmm. um the thing about wild cards for those of you that are listening at home uh so um they were edited by george rr R. martin and uh, I don't know if anyone has heard of him or not. Um, yeah. I hear he's big in other, he was, I don't know. He was part of my RPG group. Oh, right. Yes. yes. Yeah. And um, so he called them mosaic novels. And so what's really cool about the Wild Card series is that Walter would, would you know, uh, choose like a particular character or two or three, follow those along. Melinda Snodgrass would follow, Carrie Vaughn, um, all of mm. those other, uh, and I think George R. R. Martin actually, I, I can't remember now, but I think he wrote, maybe he wrote Tachyon or something. I don't remember, but. He wrote The Great and Powerful Turtle. Oh, that's right. That's right. So. Tachyon, Tachyon was Melinda Snodgrass. Okay. Um, which was incidentally not in, not from George's role playing game, but from my role playing game at Doctor Tacky. Oh, so, ladies and gentlemen, are you taking yeah. a dig at George R. Yeah. R. Martin? No, I'm not. I'm just pointing. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just giving myself credit where credit is due. Of course. Or and actually, give give Melinda credit because she created oh, the character. That yes, absolutely as well. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to get at here is. What's it like for a writer that goes back on his previous day's work and like just tries to get all his ducks in a row, straighten things out, and then has a clear outline of where he's going? What's it like for you to run an RPG with particularly that that circle of writers um, yeah. that are taking things in their own direction? It, it was well, uh, George in particular likes to take things in his own direction. He's um, he came. He, he moved to New Mexico in 1979 and got to know the other writers and were, was invited into the RPG group that we already had going. Uh, but he came out, he came from a chess background. Hmm. He used to run chess tournaments back in the middle, in the uh, Midwest. Uh, and in chess, you either win or you lose. Oh. And so God. his motivation was to beat every, all the other players. Yeah by redirecting the game yeah, or um, or just unnerving the other players or doing, doing something unexpected. Um, I think I, I, uh, I mentioned before we actually started the, the streaming that uh, I had run a uh, campaign that took place in the late Roman Republic mm -hmm. um, that went for 10 years or more mm -hmm. uh, and that we all participated in and George uh, George had one character who died, and it was very tragic. We were all sad, and he created a new character who was a geographer. And this guy showed up on his boat in the midst of uh, you know, a military campaign that the Roman Republic was waging on Mithridates the Great, or one of those people. Mm -hmm. um, and his plan was that we should abandon all of the stuff that we were doing and go marching off into the interior of Asia so that the geographer could write a geographic history of everything he found there. And he was just astounded when nobody else wanted to go with him. Right. I was thinking, I, maybe you should do something about Mithridates before you yeah, <laughs> before right. you, you set off this this uh, expedition. Oh my um, gosh, that's so funny. That's that's kind of ridiculous, like in a way. And the fact that yeah. so you were you were running the Roman campaign. Yeah. Is that correct? And then there was there were was there another campaign? I ran a lot of campaigns, but uh, but I sort of settled into the Roman one over time. Okay, and yeah. so were you playing with fellow writers? For... Just about all of them were writers. So my... Melinda Snodgrass, um, Daniel Abraham, the young Daniel Abraham, um, uh, who is now half of James S. A. Corey, creator of the go. Expanse. Right there we go. Um, 
you know, Victor Milan, uh, the late Victor Milan, we lost him a few years ago. Um, and, and then a friend of mine from high school named Chip Weidman, R.D. Weidman Jr. And he actually created some Wild Cards characters, but he's not a writer and he never uh, contributed to the writing. Um, and I'm sure I'm leaving people out. Ian Tregillis at one point, he's a terrific writer from Santa Fe. Wow. Uh, Roger Zelazny, how did I forget Roger That's Zelazny? Right. Yeah, Jane Linskold. Um, you know, Roger was only playing with us the last year of his life. Mm -hmm. And he was all, he was already ill and he was kind of reaching out to, he, he's a very shy man. Yeah. And, uh, he was kind of reaching out to everybody, I think. Yeah. But he, he played such off center characters that, um, uh, can it's, I? It's, 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 yeah, go ahead. Can I ask you about something? So you mentioned that Roger Zelazny was you felt was kind of reaching out in that last year. Mm -hmm. Do yeah. you think? Um, is there something you can get out of role playing, perhaps that maybe you don't quite get out of a novel, and maybe? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's interactive, right? I mean, the the novel is interactive insofar as you can identify with the characters, maybe, but. But you're not making decisions for those characters. Those decisions have already been made. But if you are role playing, you can make decisions for your characters, and you can, you know, lead other characters to reinforcing your decisions or denying your decisions or whatever. It's it's interactive. Um, so that's that's a cool thing. And also, a lot of the people that I role played with had acting backgrounds. Oh, they had been actors or other sorts of performers, mm -hmm. and so they just took the role playing stuff and ran ran with it we you know it, it got to where we were we were so much in each other's heads that we could just pretty much toss the rules aside right and and just just spend the whole time role playing um and that was that was enormous fun also a challenge because you had to keep up with all these guys well i was gonna so, say so, bright and so creative yeah i would be so nervous playing like if it were me either GMing or even just playing with a room full mm -hmm. of writers, I would just be kind of like, just just hoping that maybe I said something that would interest huh. the other the other players. And, and like, I can't imagine the complex plots that maybe mm -hmm. each player may be trying to weave into the story. But I guess on the other hand, it's collaborative. So everyone's yeah. theoretically supposed to be kind of collaborating a bit, except for... George R. R. Martin, who's just trying to. Yeah. Trying oh, to... I, he also played a sentient rock. Really? In, in one campaign. Um, <laughs> it, was a... It, was a, it was a space opera type scenario. Right. And he played a sentient rock. Uh, and I was I was the captain of the ship that the sentient rock was on. Is this, and... are, are we talking like the Corbinite maneuver type? Or wait, not the Corbinite. What was it? Uh, Devil in the Dark, the Star Trek episode. Uh, uh yes yeah it was it was, it was a silicon based life form wow but the thing is i noticed that this silicon silicon based life form was hiving off bits of himself that would sneak off and right right uh and so there you know it was like a single celled animal that was just would not stop reproducing mm, yeah and... not unlike george's books yeah, or there you go. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, and so I realized this was George's George's way of taking over my campaign. Is that soon there was going to be nothing but silicon-based rock life forms yeah. left in this universe if I if I you know didn't put a stop to him somehow. Um, and uh, and so I, you know, I fed the rock some radioactive <laughs> matter, and uh, and so I was each of these. I was able to track down these little radioactive glowing rocks on my ship. <laughs> I like it. And, and round them up and shoot, shoot them into the sun or something. I don't remember what I did with them, but but George was j jumping up and down saying I'd committed genocide. <laughs> oh no! How do you go about then? So, for example, you were you were saying that this will be your first game that you're running in a while. It's been a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. How are you going to sit down and sort of plot this out? Uh, because it's it's obviously different than a novel because you can't be too married to your yeah. ideas. You have yeah. to be kind of willing to play a little bit here. Is there is there a particular approach you take or something? Well, there are there are going to be beats that are going to be necessary for the story to happen at all. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of people hanging out together. So yeah, so there there'll, there'll be some beats. Um, you know, I'm going to have to force some things to happen. 
Um, and I, I think I can do it legitimately. Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah. No one ever knows if you just hide the dice from your players. Nobody knows yeah, if it's that. legit yeah. or illegit. Like, well, yeah, especially if you're rolling them, you know, off screen. Right. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's right. Everything's virtual. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no one's going to know about that. Uh -huh. Um. So then. But I, I hope I can get it moving fast enough. Yeah. Um, is it. So it, can I assume that this is a one shot? It's a one shot. So then you're going to have three to four hours to kind of move it. That's one thing I've had trouble with and have been trying to sort of develop. Uh -huh. Like I play campaigns so uh -huh. much that um, I've gotten used to this sort of kind of meandering sort of style where I allow each person to sort of enjoy the moment and enjoy what they're yeah. doing and then try to build in a greater narrative. But one thing I've had a challenge with was uh, is um, getting a three to four hour adventure to to work. Um, mm -hmm. in a way that has a contained beginning, middle, and end, or if not that, at least a satisfying beginning, middle, and end. Um, so have what would your approach to something like that be? Would you plot out maybe those beats? Within... I, I, I have to plot out the beats because I, I, can't, I can't know what the how the characters are going to react to what's going to happen. Right. Yeah, so... Um, but... Uh, pretty much most of my players are veteran role players who know themselves how to keep a story moving. Yeah. And we're going to, we're going to do rehearsal. What? At some point. Yeah. Is this more like professional wrestling where things are rehearsed in advance? No, no, we're not, we're not, we're not going to rehearse the scenario. We're just going to rehearse playing online and stuff because none of us have ever done it. Ah, okay. That makes a lot of sense. And, and working and working with the game mechanics so that nothing is going to surprise us, you know, on the day. So, if this is set in the wild cards universe, will you be creating? Will you be going back to? Will you be playing the characters that you all wrote, or are you coming up with fresh characters? Are you? Uh, the, 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 it, that's entirely up to the player. There will be characters. Melinda Snodgrass is playing a character that she created for the game, um, or for the for the series i'm sorry uh let's see i think max max gladstone is as well uh carrie vaughn has a new character um and uh carol inspector has a new character i think it'll be an interesting dynamic because um there's only one male player cool you know, three yeah. three women a guy um yeah who fortunately is the one who who has uh, a lot of experience with doing stuff like this so right um but it, it looked like we weren't going to have Max, and and you know everyone that we were proposing was was female, and I thought it may be an all girl squad here. That'll be kind of cool. Yeah, that is pretty neat. I like yeah. it. Will Will you be? Um, I don't want to. I don't want to steal too much of the information of what's going to happen here, and I, I hope uh, uh, you don't mind me asking. But will you be like advancing the timeline so that to kind of bring things up where maybe there's been a gap since. The last books were no i'm not gonna i'm not gonna sort it in it's just gonna be roughly contemporary because okay. you know getting it getting into the, the 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 series which you know now has several books in the Ex hopper right that haven't even been published yet and yeah and, and, yeah i'm just gonna say look just find a reason for your character to be in green bay on this particular day right, now, there, right. There, there, there's a spoiler for you it's going to take place in green bay wisconsin there we go oh my gosh that's yes. it <laughs> Yeah, it's I've been fun. in Green Bay exactly once in my life, and that's once more than any of the other players have been in Green Bay. That's that's it. And see, that's what I was. That's sort of like what I meant before. Um, so again, we were talking a little bit before the stream, and I was mentioning to Walter how a couple of my players who I play with here on the channel uh, were pretty excited that I was interviewing you, and said, "Oh, well, since you're interviewing Walter John Williams, and you just talked to like the guys that created uh, Cyberpunk uh, 2020." why don't we do a cyberpunk game set in the hard wired universe? And I was like yeah. super intimidated. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can get all my facts straight. And I, I don't know if I can get all my ducks in a row. Um, yeah. But but I was able to offer reassurance because yes. I said that if you are the GM, it is your world. Yes, I am going to be. Th that's the recording that I wanted. So this is exactly mm -hmm. what I'm going to spring. At this moment is when I'm springing on my players when they're like, wait a oh. minute, that didn't happen in the book 
Um, <laughs> I I appreciate that, Walter. Um, well, I have I have I have participated as a player in in RPGs of hardware, and you know, and the, and the GM was doing stuff that I would never have done. Right. Right. But it was their world when they were running it. I right. wasn't going to tell them they couldn't. Um, right. And we have some. We had some strangely memorable characters in my hardwired campaigns too. We had at one point the 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 team was hired by a classical pianist who was played by Melinda Snodgrass, and he had he had been a classical pianist who had been fired by his record company uh, in favor of another younger, more charismatic pianist. And we were hired to sabotage this guy's debut concert. But you know, thought, you don't get the, you don't get that kind of thing happening very often. Right? I no, I'm gonna say I am all for that. I mean, I yeah. like I love it. I think that's great. I mean, right now I have I have Mark Twain, and uh, his his uh, his unfortunate his son died, but his his son Langdon Clemens in my campaign. Right. I've sort of the the players have figured out part of this but not all of it and i also have um i also have a few of mark twain's creations running around which uh -huh. now they probably know i just told them but um yes, I'm, i know this you might look up a story of mine it's available in electronic edition um called the boolean gate and it mm -hmm. is mark twain and nikola tesla versus the singularity that I had not heard of in your record. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll definitely check that out. Um, well, Walter, uh, I want to thank you very much for for coming on. And I was. Oh, it's been my pleasure. I I don't want to take. I you've been very kind with your time. I want everybody to know. Like uh, I just emailed Walter just completely out of out of the blue, and he was very kind. He very kindly accepted my offer and and was very generous with his time. So. Uh, I'm very appreciative uh, for you to have to have come on the program. Um, oh sure, it's been my pleasure, and uh, I always enjoy these meetings. So thank you, thank Maybe you. Maybe we can do it again. Oh, absolutely! <laughs> I would, I would love to. I would love to. Uh, I haven't I, run out of work yet. I know, and I haven't. I've barely touched on. People should also know. I sent him a. a I sent Walter a list of questions, and I barely touched upon probably thirty percent of them, and we also mm -hmm. meandered into other areas. So. I always have some questions for yeah. you. I feel I should do my little commercial break. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, what's what do you okay, got here's coming the up? Practice, which is the first first in mm -hmm. seven books currently in print, mm -hmm. um, and it is a far future space opera. Um, and I know my 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 elevator pitch is it's war and revolution as seen through the eyes of two star-crossed lovers. Or alternatively, to star-crossed lovers view war and revolution. Um, Absolutely, whichever way you want to slice yeah. it. Yep. And I do want to say, as an English teacher, for those uh -huh. of you that are watching, um, Walter, in my opinion, is a very good example of an author to watch as far as crossing and mixing genres goes, as far as like a real kind of a mastery of the language and of... I would say maybe the architecture of different genres. And mm -hmm. uh, again, we talked about some of these things a little bit before the stream. Um, but honestly, as an English teacher, if you are looking at like, well, how do I, what do I want to approach this? Uh, mm -hmm. How do I want to approach this? What do I want to sort of look at? What are some key important things like say in science fiction versus cyberpunk versus fantasy? Um, and it's a great opportunity for you to, see, you to see these genres mixed together. Because a lot of times when you take a look at maybe something that Walter has written and you compare it to a standard work in, say, the science fiction genre or the cyberpunk genre, you can see the different bits, the different genres that he's mixing in there and how he's flavoring it in a way. And that, it teaches you something. If you're, if you're reading it even beyond just a great story, interesting characters, um, it does teach you something about um, what good writing is and what a mastery of different genres is. Well, thank well. you. You No, you're very welcome. And and like I said... I, I, but I still have more visual aids, so here is... <laughs> well, this is Hired Wired. This is what we were talking hardwired, about. Hardwired, which we mentioned, it is, this yeah. is the new 30th anniversary, the 30th anniversary edition. Yeah. 
which I have published myself. Yep. Oh, um, that's why it's got the cool the, cover. Yeah, it's got essays on the book's origin and and other things of interest. Um, and this isn't available yet, but should be soon. The best of Walter John Williams yes. from Subterranean Press. Yes. Is two hundred thousand words of my short fiction. The absolute best that would fit between these covers and. Um, there have, because of the pandemic, there are issues with printers. Yeah. If so, a, a lot of, of um, books are appearing late because the the printers were in lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. I no. The same thing has been happening so, in the RPG industry. Uh -huh. And one thing we should note about that is that Subterranean Press is very good. Um, they publish some of the best. Uh, uh, genre fiction like you'll see like science fiction or horror in there mm -hmm. um they're very good like on a mechanical level just in like the quality of the books that they publish and they're good yeah. on their selections um so they publish a lot of really nice collector's editions um yeah. but the cool thing about subterranean is that it's not just like okay this is what's popular uh or this is what's like cool right now or this is like whatever they're publishing really high quality stories um, mm -hmm. So if it's coming from Subterranean Press and it's been, I did they assemble the the short stories or is this are these short stories that you kind of put together? Um, it's mostly me. Okay, cool. Mostly the stuff I wanted there, but they there is some stuff that hasn't been collected before because they nice. insisted it had to have that to be commercial at all. Mm -hmm. um, there's a uh, um, and and some you know. Uh, the, the editors there said had their favorites too, and I wasn't going to disagree with them. So, yeah, of yeah. course not. But um, Walter, once again, thank you so much. It's It's been a lot of fun. I, I very much appreciate your time. Uh, and uh, I, I, wish you, I wish you the best in the future. And I also hope that uh, we get to talk again because this has been yeah. really cool for That'd me. That would be terrific. All right, um, I look forward. Thank you very much, Walter. And to all of you watching at home, uh, I'm going to put some links in uh, the comment section below or in the description, and uh, I'll uh, link to some places where you can get uh, Walter's books and, and definitely that Subterranean Press edition. I, I highly recommend them as, as far as like the quality of their books. Good choice in, in, in quality of the, the book itself and the, the writing. So thank you yeah. all very much. Everybody have a very and, good day. Thank you all out there in audiovisual land. <laughs> good night, everyone. Good night.